Hello, world. Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to have all of you with us to this uh, great uh, HEDA Datathon on great challenges. Let me uh, welcome everyone uh, in the name of the Helmholtz Information and Data Science Academy. Uh, my name is Andreas. I'm uh, heading this academy, and I'm very excited to have all of you with us today to this great uh, coding and data challenge event um, that we want to conduct over the next two days. So um, uh, I don't want to take a lot of your time because you want to dive into all these great data sets and log into our supercomputing systems. But before we get started, let me just take a very brief uh, time for a very brief introduction so you know who you're dealing with today. So um, first of all, let me, let me introduce to you our head organization, the, the Helmholtz Association of German Research Centers. Um, so the Helmholtz uh, Association um, is one of uh, the large um, German research organizations. Um, uh, over 40,000 researchers, scientists and staff uh, organized in 19 national labs are conducting research for all the pressing challenges of society, of uh, humanity, of tomorrow. And um, uh, all these researchers are grouped in six um, research areas. Um, so uh, you have the research energy of uh, research field of energy, where we are trying to find uh, great new solar cells, new batteries, uh, new smart grid technology. Uh, then there's the research field of uh, matter, which is running the big particle accelerators. Uh, I myself, I'm a physicist. I'm from that field, and um, we're trying to understand what um, what ties together the the matter around us, the stars, and the astrophysics programs are located there. Um, then there's a very important research field of health. So uh, we're conducting cancer research, diabetes research. So trying to tackle the, uh, the great um, diseases that are threatening societies. And um, then there's a the field of information technologies. Uh, very excited uh, about that one. We are trying to find uh, the quantum computing systems of, of tomorrow. We're conducting uh, research uh, on, on some of the largest computer sets uh, of, of Europe. So you uh, are able to, to log into some of these resources uh, later in the course of the, uh, of the uh, datathon. Um, and then there's um, uh, the research field that um, uh, conducts research regarding uh, aeronautic space and transport. So the German um, uh, research program and astrophysics program is located there. And um, then, of course, there's the research field of Earth and environment. This is the research field that we're dealing with uh, today. So um, our scientists are conducting research in all areas of, uh, of the Earth, of the ecosystem, starting from the very high levels of the atmosphere, the clouds uh, going down to rain and hydro systems, um, a very important uh, field of, uh, of interest for us uh, in the times of climate change and uh, pending droughts. And um, we're also conducting research in the vast polar regions. We got some very uh, exciting ship missions going on, um, trying to figure out what's happening with the Arctic and um, uh, how um, climate and weather is um, changing there. So um, one thing ties the challenges that these research fields are facing in the futures together. And uh, these are the new opportunities and um, uh, possibilities that arise from modern day information and data science. The new methods, the new technologies, uh, artificial intelligence and big data mining and stuff like that. And um, um, we got together with uh, leading experts from information and data science from all over the organization, from all these exciting research fields a couple of years ago. And we tried to figure out what can we do to bring all this technology at hand to a greater use, to a greater good. So how can we use the vast supercomputing system? How can we utilize artificial intelligence to heal diseases, to stop climate change, to mitigate, to build robot systems and energy systems of the future? And um, all these experts um, uh, advised us to, to put together not only uh, uh, ambitious um, research programs in information and data science, but also um, invest heavily in, in new talents, in new brains, in, uh, in you. So we're happy to have you with us because we founded the Helmholtz Information and Data Science Academy that I'm proudly representing today. So um, let me introduce to you this academy that's the organizing institution of today, very briefly to you. And um, uh, what is the Helmholtz Information and Data Science Academy? Can I have the next slide, please? Um, 
So um, as I introduced to you before, we have 19 national labs uh, located all over Germany. Uh, and um, we introduced to, to these national labs uh, a, sys a framework of, of newly and novel research schools, tying together the domain expertise, let's say from oncology or particle physics, together with the technology expertise um, uh, in the field of information and data science. And we founded um, six great research schools that are endowed with enough funding to promote the careers of 250 and even more in the future of brilliant young minds uh, promoting this uh, future uh, of research. So uh, we're collaborating with 14 national labs and 17 top tier universities uh, all over the country from Hamburg down to Munich and um, uh, to bring a more lively ecosystem around this we, we decided to, to put together great events like this here um, so we can reach out to you guys because uh, science has never been as open as it is today. The, the, the methods and the possibilities arising from all digitization it makes it possible to have you from all around the globe to come together with us and have a look how can we change the future how can we utilize information data science, uh, data science for the greater good and today we will focus on some very very exciting challenges arising in the field from from climate change and um, you will have the opportunity to get together with our leading researchers dive into real life data real life big data sets that we have collected and that we're still collecting right now and uh, you will be able to access some of our greatest uh, supercomputing systems in Karlsruhe and Ulick during the course of this datathon. So we're really excited. I mean, I could talk for hours now about all the great research that Helmholtz is doing, but please take your time, Google us, find us, uh, get in touch. I mean, everybody uh, is always uh, happy to talk some um, uh, new talents, some, some people excited about our, re about our research. Um, everything that we're doing is up in the open. Everything is, is, is open as it is today. So, um, what are we going to do in the next uh, two days? We want to introduce to you uh, some, some, let's say, exemplary uh, data sets that we're working on. Uh, we'll have uh, great challenge providers from uh, numerous uh, institutes today. Um, we're accompanied by, by several um, judges and advisors, and we would just love for you to dive into the challenges, have a look at things that we're doing, and bring your ideas, your smart um, new approaches uh, to the table and to the groups. So uh, I'm talking to you from this very nice uh, nightclub, the House Ungarn in downtown Berlin. So we would have loved to, to invite you all here and have a nice party tonight. Um, but um, well, the situation is as it is. And um, so stay safe, stay home. Uh, but when the situation clears out and our friends from the medical research field finally find a cure for this, uh, so um, I guess uh, it will be very, very possible to have all of you here and I'll invite you all for a cocktail after all the challenges are solved. So, uh, but that's um, uh, basically uh, enough from me. I hope you got a little bit of insight who we are and what we're trying to do. But uh, as pointed out, if you have any questions, just get in touch with us after the program. Uh, we're very happy to talk to every one of you and um, that's what we're paid for, right? <laughs> so. Um, to guide us through the program, we're very happy that we found a very uh, nice moderator for the day. I'll have him on stage in a second, um, uh, and he will uh, guide you through the course of um, the program. We're looking forward for two very exciting and um, uh, thrilling uh, two days. And um, well, Fabian, it's very nice of you to, to join. Thank Please you join much. me on stage. Uh, I'll keep my distance here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, very great to have you. The stage is basically yours. Um, I hope you're as excited about the next two days as I am. Sure. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm looking forward to the cocktails, by the way. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll so do this next time. But before I let you <laughs> off the stage, um, yeah. so what do you personally expect from the Datathon? Do you have any expectations? Well, um, I would just love for everyone logged in to, to just check out what we're doing, right? Yeah. Um, because a lot of people, when they hear artificial intelligence or this, um, this machine learning business, they, they think about the Google and the Amazon and maybe some even killer robots <laughs> and the Chinese and surveillance later on. But I would love for everyone to, to check out the possibilities that arise from the technologies mm -hmm. in this most important fields of, of societal changes yeah. uh, and challenges. And um, for everyone to get involved, to, to bring some ideas to the table, maybe even later on collaborate and mm -hmm. uh, be a part of this. and. Um, yeah, some, some engagement with the ideas uh, that uh, we have on the table. That would be just lovely. Yeah. 
So the, the networking is also a big part of what we are doing here, right? So it's a huge yeah. part of, of who you are, basically, as yeah. Heimholz, <laughs> you personally, your team. Yeah. Um, so everyone should out, reach out to you and your team. And um, so, for Obviously, example... I mean, as pointed out, I mean, science has never been more borderless, mm -hmm. more open, more transparent than it has been today. I mean, yeah. obviously, we have people logged in, ob apparently, from, from Australia. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's just amazing. I mean, I would love for all of you to come from Australia here for, <laughs> for the cocktails and the next data thon. But, yeah. but, but um, let's be realistic. But the, the, the digital format that we put together today that you are so kindly moderating uh, gives us a chance to, to reach out to... to to brilliant people from all over the world. And that's, that fills me with such excitement. Yeah. And if some of you uh, later on think, hey, this is a place where I can like, really put my brains into good use, I mean, obviously, get in touch. I mean, there's a big program. There's numerous opportunities for people uh, to, to put their, their technology, their skills to, to good use and um, to promote this message a little bit. Um, that, that would be just perfect. So the Heimels is huge. <laughs> where, where, where do I start? So, I mean, <laughs> we talked about it a bit before. So, um, any hints, any tips where I should start if I want to find out more about... I mean, we all know the web pages, but mm -hmm. um, do you have any insights, maybe? Well, uh, events like this. I mean, this is mm -hmm. like a little bit of a door opener. Obviously, you cannot, um, like present all of Helmut's research of 40,000 <laughs> people working yeah. every day, very smart people working on everything every day. I mean, not even I know everything but what the people are doing, but having like a little glimpse and get some, some, some hands-on exper experience with what we're doing, log into the system, check out the data, and um, that maybe gives you a little bit of, of a taste uh, mm -hmm. what we're dealing with every day. And uh, after that, I mean, contact the coaches, contact the challenge provider, contact us. I mean, uh, the heater obviously is there as a, as a portal, as, as like, a, like a first address to, to get in contact with. And, um, but I'm very sure that all the researchers in our institute are always glad when somebody reaches out to them and say like, dude, I, I got some skills here. Mm -hmm. You're working on this nice robot system. Can <laughs> I get in touch? Can I yeah. participate? And uh, as pointed out, I mean, it has never been as easy as it is today to, to collaborate remotely and uh, get in touch and maybe maybe uh, start a scientific career from that or do like a couple of years with us before you're heading out for the big bucks at the Amazon and put some, some good use to your skills before that. Um, all these opportunities are there and we are more than glad to, to, to connect you with the right people. So, and you're looking for the right people to join you, right? So sure, sure. Everyone out there, um, thank you, Andreas. Um, but for now, have fun. I mean, exactly. these challenges are great, and I'm very happy to have you here, Fabian. And thanks to all the staff of House Ungarn, to my team. Exactly. This will be a great two days. And tackle these challenges, guys. Have fun. <laughs> thank you very much, Andreas. All right. Yeah, welcome to the... Data Datathon. <laughs> um, my name is Fabian and I'll be your moderator for the next two days. Um, we got a lot to cover, so I'll jump straight to it um, and have a look if this one is working now. I'll gladly talk about the agenda for today and tomorrow. So, this morning after my introduction, I'll hand over to the challenge providers. They will give you an introduction to each of the challenges. We have around five of them, so each of them gets around 10 minutes um, where they will introduce you to their, their challenges. And you can ask questions afterwards. So we decided to do it uh, in our Slack channel. If you d didn't join our Slack channel, please do so. You got an invitation. It's important to be there. After the introductions of the challenges, we will have a 20-minute introduction of the HPC systems and our providers there. They will give you um, information about how you use your system, all that, what you need to work on it. Um, it will take around 20 minutes. And after that, you should actually be all set to start pitching your ideas. Your ideas will be pitched in Slack. If you don't have an idea, don't worry. You can just join someone um, on their idea. We will talk about that in a minute. Yeah, and after that, you can just keep on working. We will keep you alone. You can start uh, working on your own in your team, but reach out to us if you got any questions. We are here for you all the time. Tomorrow at 9 a.m., I will uh, announce a briefing for the day. It's important that you watch that, but don't worry. We'll record that session. So even if you don't join us at 9 a.m., it's completely fine. You can watch the video, the recording later on. We will um, put that into the Slack channel as soon as possible. But it's crucial that you watch the video. It will contain a lot of information you actually need to yeah, finish the data thon. So tomorrow at 3 p.m., we kindly ask you to submit your pitch videos. 
Again, don't worry, we'll give you all the information you need tomorrow, um, but take into account that it will take around 30 to 60 minutes to record the video and especially to set up the software if you didn't. So by now, um, yeah. As well, we'll ask you to create a crew picture. And um, we know we can be all in the same room, so you have to be creative or get to, create to be creative, but we'll get some tips on that later on too. At 4.30 p.m., we will have the award ceremony where we hope everyone is still available and uh, with us. Um, we will have the jury and the challenge providers give you all the information about the winning teams. And after that, we'll immediately, immediately broadcast the winnings uh, the winners pitch videos. So this will take around, yeah, depending, so 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And that's for the agenda. As you can imagine, planning an event like this is a lot of work. And up until last week, I think, we hoped that we had around 40 to 50 people, I'm looking to the team, um, here with us in Berlin. Um, but it was the right decision to not do it, especially with the new cases today in Germany with 20,000 people infected with COVID-19. So we are still happy um, that you are with us, um, but all of that would not be possible with the right partners. So a big, big thank you goes out to NVIDIA, Deloitte on the Umweltbundesamt, um, which helped us a lot with um, especially knowledge. So we will meet all of them later in the Slack channel. Lots of people from, from these uh, different organizations are in the help channel already, by the way. Um, yeah, thank you very much for supporting this cause. It's really great to have you on board. And please, participant, reach out to them. They are here for you. They are at your service, so make use of that, please. Now I'm going to talk about the challenges. As mentioned before, I'll hand over to the challenge introducers, to the challenge providers in a minute. We'll have five people giving you the information, each one by one. Finding the best possible solution for their challenges helps our scientists to investigate climate change from deep sea to space. So what you guys are doing is super important. And on a personal note, I've attended, organized and moderated dozens of hackathons and datathons and however you name them. But it's, it's my honest opinion that what you guys are tackling here is one of the most important things we are, yeah, you, you can actually tackle. So um, upfront, thank you very much that you guys are participating in these uh, challenges and take on all yeah, these bigger questions we have out there. And we hope, of course, you enjoy the time as well. As mentioned before, um, the challenge providers will be in our Slack channel. So um, there's, if you are at your desk at the moment, just see there's, there's a help channel and everyone is in there where they will introduce you um, their self, themselves later on as well. So um, please join if you didn't, as mentioned before. Um, in case of any questions, ask them in the help channel and ping the specific question, uh, the challenge provider. Um, each slide has an at character on it and a, a username, basically. So you find the, the providers in the Slack channel and you can ping them. If you don't know how to do it, it's uh, written on the GIF. GIF. Um, just write your text, type in the at car and um, search or use the, 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 the information provided. All right, that's it for now. And I'm going to introduce you to our first challenge provider. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so kicking things off is Leonard Schmidt. He's a research associate at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig. He holds a master's degree in hydrology. Yeah, he's interested in extreme events and their risks, which he explores with science methods. So I hope, Leonard, you are already connected and here. Let's have a look. Yes, I am. So the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. All right, then let me just quickly share my screen. So, you share your presentation, right? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, hi everyone, hi Fabian, thanks for having me. Um, maybe just a quick note, I mean, you introduced myself, I'll then in turn just quickly introduce my center. So, the Helmut Center for Environment, Environmental Research, um, yeah, it's about 1,100 employees that basically do research on everything that is terrestrial environment, so everything that happens on the land surface of the Earth. Um, we're pretty diverse, actually, as to what we do research on. 
So it's everything from water to forest to the soils to ecology to society and environment to environmental chemistry. So that's the whole broad field. And as you mentioned, I'm more from the side of hydrology. So I'm the water guy. Um, but today here I am the water and the soil guy. Let's put it that way. So the, my challenge, um, yeah, it's called spot the mistake in about 50 million data points. Um, and those of you that have read the description already um, know that it's about soil moisture at a specific location, which is called the Holes Holz. Let me do a quick introduction about this location. <clears throat> So the site, Hohes Holz, is one of our research observatories. It's located in northern Germany. Uh, we've got a couple of those. So what is an observatory? Basically, just like a really small plot. So in this case, it's one hectare. So 100 meters by 100 meters of a forest patch um, in Hohes Holz, where our scientists just put loads and loads of sensors um, to measure a lot of, climb, of environmental variables. So this specific site, so the Hohes Holz site, has a focus on the exchange of water and gas fluxes between the soil and vegetation and the atmosphere. And why is that important? Um, for us, it's, it is important to understand the role of the forest and the soil in with regards to change in climate, for example. So it's not that well understood um, how, for example, vegetation, different vegetation types um, change the, well, the transfer of gas, of, of trace gases, of water to the atmosphere and um, how that changes over time. And so that's why our scientists have set up this observatory site. And also, so here, this picture, picture on the left, they do yeah, they gather data right on the soil and right at the trees. So they measure how much water is flowing through the trees. They measure how much water there is in the soil. Mm. And climatic variables, so precipitation, temperature, yeah, how the vegetation grows. But also they set up this big eddy covariance tower. Um, so it's basically a tower of 50 meters is equipped with sensors. I think every three to five meters. So they measure what gases, what, how much vapor actually um, travels between the soil and vegetation and the atmosphere to better understand the role of forests in climate change. And especially in this, in this um, case, the, the soils of forest and their role for climate change. So that's the background. That's why our researchers are, are working on that, are spending a lot of hours to maintain this research site. And as I said today, uh, we're focusing on their data on soil moisture. So they do have a lot of these devices that you can see to the right here. Um, these are TDR soil moisture sensors, so time domain reflectancy. And what they actually do, as you can see in this small graphic in the bottom, is they actually dig a hole and then they place six sensors at one location in different depths. So the, these are numbered from one to six. Um, and those six sensors are connected to a box, which is that black thing in the photo. And those are placed all over that research site, of, all over that observatory. So as I said, it's 100 meters by 100 meters. And we've got 40 of those boxes that are measuring constantly and each of these boxes has six sensors so we're at 240 sensors on this fairly small patch of forest so they're really trying to understand how soil moisture and soil temperature because these sensors actually measure both soil moisture and soil temperature how these change over time with respect to precipitation with respect to the vegetation that is above so the trees how they grow up top but, and that is the big challenge and the big problem, um, as almost all sensors, these sensors produce errors. And well, the tricky part about soil moisture sensors is that you might even see that there is a problem with the sensor, but it's sort of hard to replace it because you'd have to dig up the ground again. 
by doing that, you basically have to shift the, the site of measurement because you disturb the whole soil around it. Um, so it's not that easy. So it's more important for us to identify erroneous values in the time series of soil moisture and soil temperature that we get from these sensors um, because we cannot just go there and replace them. So that's why we are focusing a lot on the topic of automated quality control, so cleaning our data, finding errors in our data. How has that, um, yeah, maybe I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll give a quick introduction about soil moisture data in general, just to give you a feeling of what this variable looks like. So we've got data from five to eight years, depending on, on which sensor we're looking at. And as I said, um, soil moisture is, yeah, it's a really important variable to understand climate change and the effect of uh, vegetation and soil on the atmosphere. But it's also a pretty tricky one because it's very variable in time and space. So I've plotted one of these time series here. So as I said, one of these boxes is connected to six sensors. So SM1 to SM6, as I labeled them here. And just by looking at the overall graph, you can already see that there is usually <clears throat> there's not much happening. So the whole soil dries out and then there is a rain event, precipitation event, and all of a sudden soil moisture spikes, but only for a pretty short time. And then depending on how deep you are in the ground, the soil dries out rather quickly again, or it keeps a certain, certain soil moisture. Also in that small patch of forest between the sensors, there's a high variance already of different dynamics because the soil texture and the soil type, they vary quite a lot in small, in, in, in small areas as well. Um, and what you can see in this plot as well, something very specific for, for soil moisture. Um, so if you think about it, so SM1, SM2, they are at the top layer of the soils. So if it rains, they get wet super fast. And if there's sun, they dry out pretty fast. So these red and orange lines, they are pretty spiky. And then the bluish ones, for example, so the ones that are like half a meter into the ground, they have a much more constant behavior. And that's what we're actually using, or that's what the idea is to use these characteristics at different depth to identify erroneous values. Because what we see quite often is more of this situation. Uh, so in this time series, you can see up at the top, you can see the raw data with errors. And these errors are colored in red and black. And then below you find a corrected time series. So that's what we would want it to, to look like in the ideal case. Uh, and you can see that sometimes sensors just drift off. They yeah, have a spiky behavior just because, quite often because the battery voltage um, goes down or because they yeah, go bad for some other reason or miscalibration. There are a lot of different reasons. Um, so we're trying to tackle that. And um, just to give you, yeah, just to go a bit more into detail, um, just one time series of a sensor. So what our colleagues have been doing over the last, yeah, almost a decade, they have actually spent a lot of time manually checking this data. So as you can see down here, there are basically two tests that they run automatically. So that's a range test. So basically just seeing, all right, is, my, is the value of my soil moisture actually plausible? Can it physically happen? Because of course, soil moisture cannot be below zero, for example. So that's the red points that you see here. Um, and then there's an automatic check for spikes, which are the yellow, yellow dots. And there's an automated, automated check for battery voltage because we know that if that goes below a certain threshold, um, that tends to produce errors. But all the rest, everything that you see here, the green ones, for example, because I mean, if you look at this graph, you would, I mean, you see some errors that have been identified automatically, but you would say, well, this whole passage of this time series is pretty faulty. so. I'd rather not use it. So that's what my colleagues have been doing. They've been looking at the time series and manually flagging data to be erroneous. So that's the green ones, the manual flags. And that also explains, yeah, the set of quality flags that we've got. So we've got data that is 
assigned to be okay. And then we've got data that is assigned to be erroneous from automatic routines and then from a manual flagging routine as well. And of course, we yeah we want to relieve our our scientists from having to do this manually, and that's the whole idea of automated quality control. So what I've been looking into is a supervised machine learning approach where I took the data from the sensors. So this, the, we've got the photo here again that has been manually flagged by our scientists. And then I just trained a machine learning model on these manual flags to basically reproduce them to be able to use it in future so that our scientists don't have to do it manually anymore. That already worked quite well. So as you can see down here, in the graph, depending on soil depth, it's a bit more tricky in the in the topsoil layers, but uh, we were at a true positive rate, true positive accuracy of 70 to 80 percent. But uh, the big problem is that we don't have this information, so we don't have these manual flags for all the sites that we have, because we've got mm, yeah many more observatory sites, not only in the forest but on pasture and agricultural land. Um, where we don't have that information. So we want to transfer the knowledge or find a method that we can actually use at sites that have not been monitored manually before. And with that approach, I've tried it, but with my random forest approach, that does not work that well. So I cannot train my model on one side, on the whole holes, and then apply it at another side. That only works in some cases. So, and that's the bench for our participants to solve this problem in a unsupervised way. So basically to treat it like an anomaly detection. Um, and ideally, as I put it here, it would be in a semi unsupervised way so that it, that it still leaves some action for our researchers to fine tune the model in detecting or in separating good from bad values. Uh, so that we can go to a new site, apply the algorithm, tune it a bit, and then have a rough guess of what is correct and what is wrong. Why do we need this? As I said, that allows us to transfer the, mod the, the model from uh, locations where we have that information about what around ranges they use to new locations, but also it allows us to adapt to change conditions. I mean, talking about climate change, talking about how soil moisture, of course, depends on temperature and changes in temperature, um, we cannot yeah, we cannot assume that we're working with a stable system here, so it's good to be able to retrain the model in the future, which would not be possible with the approach that I used before, um, because once my model is running, my dear scientists, they will not spend any more time manually checking the data. So by the year of 2015, uh, 2025, 2030, I will not have, to have any data to train on anymore. So that's why we're trying to go the unsupervised way, as I mentioned in the description as well, there are some more extensions or some more hints on how to use this data um, that could be beneficial or that could be, well, there are sort of yeah, extensions, soft criteria as to the evaluation afterwards. Um, so, of course, we've got this whole network of sensors and they are correlated both spatially and temporally. So it's definitely worth a try to consider that. Um, that also refers to the depth information, because as I mentioned, the sensors that are lower in the soil, they react slower and not as strong as the top ones. So we've got a time lag there, we've got a time correlation there as well. Um, and ideally, I think that's a lot to ask, but um, we would have some algorithm that is robust against missing values, because of course, some of these sensors don't only produce errors, but they also just drop out. And then our model still has to work on the remaining sensors. Yeah, I hope it wasn't too detailed and too complex for someone that is not working with this data on a daily basis. Of course, I'm in the Slack channel to answer any questions afterwards. Um, I can also talk a bit more about that I've been using so far. But that's the challenge from my side. And I guess then I'll just hand it back to Fabian. I'm looking forward to to welcome new participants to help me on this problem. Yeah, thank you very much, Leonard, for the information. As you just mentioned, he's available in Slack. So please, participants, reach out to him in Slack if you've got any questions. 
his handle is at Leonard Schmidt, quite easy. We are already going to our next presenter. Next up is Martin Schroen. He's postdoc as well at the Helmsholt Center for Environmental Research in uh, Leipzig. He explores the nature of cosmic rays, neutrons, and the potential to do good for the environment and the society. So, Martin, are you with me? Yes, I am. And the stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um, let's see how I can share my screen. All right. Yes. Do you see my my uh, first slide? I okay. Slide, yeah. So thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah. Um, as as I said, as as has been said, I'm also working at the Hamel Center for Environmental Research, and by chance, we are also working on soil moisture. Um, but we have a slightly different approach. So we, you can see here in the background, for example, is um, an indication or an illustration of soil moisture that we measured in an agricultural field um, that goes from dry, uh, that, uh, that is indicated with yellow colors, to wet soil that is indicated with blue colors. And we do these measurements without any invasive methods. So we do not bury measure, uh, measurement devices in the ground. We just put a sensor in the, into a car and drive around that field. And by that, we automatically get um, measurement data from within the soil. And the only problem we have is that um, the measurement is influenced by other stuff in the, in the environment, like trees or roads or buildings. And that's why we decided to put some cameras, to mount some cameras on, on our car uh, to take some pictures while we drive and to interpret these pictures and to identify some landscape features, um, we don't really know how to do that. So that's why this challenge is about image segmentation and the identification of these, uh, of these features in these camera photographs. Um, maybe a short motivation why we're actually caring for soil moisture. It's an extremely important variable in the environment. Uh, it is, uh, it, it, it um, determines how water is distributed, whether it gets infiltrated, whether we, will, whether we will have flooding events, or whether the plant can uptake enough water to, to generate food, or whether water can, will evaporate into the atmosphere again and create some rain events later on. So it's an extremely important variable for, for weather and for climate, and that's why we really need to measure it. And there are lots of models, of course, as you might know, the drought monitor in Germany, it tells you whether we have an extreme drought or not in some regions. And uh, especially in the last years, the, the drought events have been very, um, very drastic. And uh, also heat wave uh, monitoring can be done and flood forecasting. All these things can be done with models. The only problem is that models uh, just guess like uh, they, they they calculate the soil water content, but they do not really know it in, in detail. So we need measurements to validate these models and to calibrate these models to make all these predictions much better. And we have a new instrument to measure this. And this instrument uses cosmic radiation. And cosmic radiations are all these tiny particles that go across the universe from far away galaxies and uh, supernova events to our solar system. They reach our atmosphere, they penetrate into the Earth atmosphere and into the ground. And there, there are certain particles that you call neutrons that get into the ground approximately half a meter and reflect back. And our goal is to measure these neutrons because they carry information of the water content in the ground. The nice thing about neutrons is that they they are slowed down by hydrogen. They cannot go through hydrogen, but they can go through everything else. And that's why by measuring and detecting the neutron radiation in the atmosphere, we get information about uh, hydrogen content. That's the same thing how the NASA uh, many decades ago measured the water content on the planet Mars. And uh, we'd like to do apply the same method here on Earth. So just measuring the reflected neutron radiation. And I think that's a very fancy and fascinating technique and it actually works quite well. And uh, 
we can have stationary sensors, but our team is working on mobile sensors. So we put the whole neutron detector into a car and drive around. And while driving, we measure neutrons and then we convert these neutrons to soil moisture. And by doing that, we can generate these soil moisture maps like you can see here. That's a soil moisture map of an agricultural field. And so the farmer can easily see where there are wet and dry regions. And you can do that on a small scale or even on larger scale. So like through a whole country like Saxony, Bavaria, or whatever. Um, and we did lots of measurements on a large scale also with a car. The only problem is, as I said in the, in the first slide, is that the measurement is influenced not only by soil moisture, but by all kinds of hydrogen pools. That means also hydrogen biomass and vegetation, for example. Uh, in, even in road material, whether you have concrete or asphalt or just stones, there are different types of hydrogen in it. So it, we need to know the surrounding environment better to, to create better, more accurate soil moisture, soil water content values. And uh, we actually know how, how to correct for it. We actually know when we drive on an asphalt road, how we ha do we have to correct our data? Um, and we know how, uh, how to correct our data when we drive on a dirt road, for example. So the theory is known, and even the theory of vegetation correction is known. So uh, this is an example where we measured um, the, the, the nutrients in many different fields in, um, in, in, a, in a small catchment. And on nine points, we have neutron data. So our measurements converted to soil moisture, these are the red points. And we measure true soil moisture. Uh, these are the gray points and they don't match very well. And then we correct it for road material and we correct it for vegetation type. And these are the green points. And when we do this, we can actually match the actual soil moisture very well. So we know how to correct for the environmental objects around our measurement device. But the problem is we don't know what's around us. We don't have data. And that's why uh, they had the idea to put to mount cameras on the, on the car, to take pictures every 20 seconds, um, to have, have an idea of the surrounding. And by that, in, improve the post-processing of the data. So with these cameras, you can do lots of things. You can look at it and see, OK, there's the grass harvested on the left side. There's some crop field on the right side. We are probably going on the asphalt road here. And you can look at all these different uh, pictures and get some information from that. Oh, here is probably a medium vegetation influence, and there's probably a very high influence of roads. So you can can get information from this data, and uh, you can correct the data with, with, with this information from the cameras. But of course, with the big data sets we have, um, this is a really exhausting process, and that's what you'd like to. Um, up, um, do automatically. There are also some nice pictures we have to maybe have a bee counter. So whenever you, we encounter some insects, you can actually use the cameras for insect counting, just for fun. So what we did is we used uh, Supervisely, that's a, that's a tool on the website tool, website inter interface to and to annotate our camera pictures to tell them, uh, okay, this is a tree, this is asphalt road, this is grassland and bushes. And we did this for hundreds of pictures. And by that, we'd, we'd like to, to, to make the algorithm learn um, how, to, how to identify these features. And so, so we provide uh, masks, PNG masks, uh, with, with RGB values. Each value corresponds to a different landscape feature, like tree or bush or road or whatsoever. We also provide JSON files if it's more easy for you to handle uh, these polygons in the picture. You can also use that. Um, and with this annotated data, we, we have the feeling that it must be somehow possible to train a model to find out uh, things like the trees, fraction of trees, fraction of grassland, and, and uh, type of the road and so on, but on its own without uh, human interaction. So that's the idea. And um, the applications would be uh, very broad. So with this, with this data, we, could, we have really the potential to improve our, our measurement data of soil water content, to improve all the hydrological models, the decision-making, also doing heat waves and drought events. 
and there are even more applications maybe also in remote sensing um, because people do estimate uh, the land use type the state of the crop and and so on and so on and these estimates need to be validated so you can also use this information from the camera pictures to validate remote sensing data for example and more and more applications are on the way but uh, we as environmental scientists just have no clue about modern machine learning techniques so if you have a good idea how to solve these problems we'd, we'd really be happy to involve you in our research thank you very much right thank you martin for the insights um, i especially liked the bee counting of course and by the way while we are working on serious topics here it's always have nice to have some fun part in it as well so um think about this um if you work on your projects again we don't have a q a right now but you can actually start asking questions in our slack channel um martin is there at with his handle martin schroen um i would advise you to watch the other um yeah challenge providers first and then ask your questions but maybe write them down um so you don't forget them all right the next challenge provider is eduardo zorita eduardo is a spanish paleoclimatologist um, and since 2010, he's a senior scientist at the Institute of Coastal Research at the Helmholtz Center in Geestach, where he has been working since 1969. Eduardo was contributing author of the fourth assessment report to the IPC, IPCC, and he's a review author of the journal Climate Research, which probably a few of you know. Yeah, Eduardo, are you already with me? I am here. Perfect, then, <laughs> then start. Thank you. Um, well, if you are listening to us from Australia, or from California, or from any country uh, around the Mediterranean region, you are probably aware that all these countries suffer from recurrent periods of drought, let's say seasons uh, with a very low precipitation, um, that poses a, a very um, serious problem um, to all these countries because they rely on this seasonal precipitation, for instance, uh, May accumulate over the winter and then as used for the population, for agriculture, for industry, over the whole year. Um, my challenge <coughs> is precisely to predict those periods a few months in advance. And actually, the utility uh, um, for these predictions is evident um, for all of us. If we could be able to say three or four months in advance, a dry season is approaching or oppositely a very wet season is approaching and society can adapt and take measures to smooth out the possible damages uh, to society and to industry and in general to the ecosystems. This is the challenge that I'm uh, posing you. I should say that before we go into details that this challenge is really a very difficult challenge. So there is no answer to this problem. Many groups are working in trying to find a solution for this seasonal prediction. But so far, the, the success are very limited and only restricted to some regions in the world. So what, what I would or we would expecting for you is, of course, not a full solution to this problem, but just a step in the right direction, just to show that we can make progress using these new machine learning methods uh, that can perhaps then be improved, expanded uh, towards the correct and the proper solution. Of course, if you f are able to find a solution to this problem, a complete one, then that would be great. Uh, that We wouldn't reject that at all. But I would like to lower a little bit expectations because indeed this problem is really difficult. So let me share um, my screen um, with technical details of I hope that you can see my slides now. Yes. Well, uh, my name is Eduardo Sorita, as it was uh, said just a few seconds uh, before. I'm working at the Hemholtz Center in Gestacht, uh, mostly on climate dynamics uh, and regional climate dynamics specifically. The title of the challenge is Developing Reliable Forecasts for Drought. And I already explained uh, the importance of this, of this challenge. Let me go now into more technical details. So this is a schematic view of the variations or the variability of the atmospheric flow 
of the North Atlantic European sector. So usually, um, of these regions, you have a high pressure located over the center of the mid-Atlantic, uh, over the Azores, this is called the Azores High, and you have a lower pressure sitting or roughly over Greenland. This pressure gradient uh, gives rise to the westerly winds, which are very familiar to all of us. So we have uh, systematic westerly winds flowing from the North Atlantic into Europe. So this situation actually is not completely stable, so there are some variability. So some seasons, some winters, <coughs> the atmospheric pressure here is stronger than normal, and the atmospheric pressure here in the north is lower than normal, so that the winds are stronger in, in those years, in those winters. The relevance for this atmospheric circulation is that actually is responsible for a lot of climate anomalies, and that's why we are getting now into more into the challenge. So this situation in which the pressure here is higher than normal uh, gives rise to drought conditions of the Mediterranean. Uh, on, on the other hand, it gives rise to more uh, precipitation over the um, Scandinavian Peninsula. I can show you now here a description of the intensity of this North Atlantic oscillation, what is called. It's just the seesaw of pressure between the Azores and the Iceland. Uh, and uh, this is a time series over the last 130 years, approximately, about and describing the intensity of this climate pattern. So the red values uh, indicate that this patch, uh, pattern has been more intense. That means that it's related to drought conditions in the Mediterranean. And blue colors indicates the opposite direction, uh, indicates a weaker circulation over the North Atlantic and Europe, and wetter conditions in the Mediterranean region. If we look, for instance, at the years 1990, you see the very high values of this index. And that actually that translated in very dry conditions over those winters. Uh, actually, I, I experienced that uh, personally. And it was really very, very hard. So for instance, the water delivery for population was restricted uh, to a few hours per day, because they actually the reservoirs were empty. Um, if we had been able to predict this situation, actually the, these very high peaks, a few months in advance, perhaps society could, have be could be better prepared and cope to these situations. So the specific challenge, as I said, is to predict this index, so the value of this index in time for its winter, based only in information that is available in the few months before. Um, as I said, uh, perhaps to predict the exact value of the index is really difficult. And it's indeed a very, very challenging challenge, if I may say that. Um, so perhaps a weaker goal is perhaps to predict only the categories. So is the, will this index be very strong, strong, weak, or very weak? That would be also very useful for us. Um, this North Atlantic Oscillation, this seesaw of pressure between Azores and, and, uh, the, and Iceland, is a very large um, atmospheric, large-scale atmospheric pressure. I plot here well, the result of a principal component analysis of the sea level pressure field. So this analysis actually takes the sea level pressure in each location as the variables and produces well, the leading principal component analysis or empirical orthogonal function. Uh, for some of you, and you can see that this is a very large scale feature. So the hope is that this very large scale feature over the winter can be predicted with large predictors, large scale predictors in the autumn. And these large scale predictors will be also the sea level pressure, but also the near surface temperature. Um, these are two predictors that possibly will be able to predict the state of the North Atlantic Oscillation a few months in advance. Of course, we have observation data only over the past uh, 130 years. These are very few data sets. The sample size will be very small for this challenge. So we are going to work with synthetic data in a synthetic ideal world in which we have a lot of data, no data gaps, and no measurement errors. These are data from a climate model simulation. Uh, the climate models, are, as I will explain in a minute, are not perfect, 
but they are very realistic. And for our purposes, they are ideal, because we have a lot of data, we know the truth, and so we can test our methods against that synthetic truth. So we will use synthetic data from a climate simulation uh, that covers 1,000 years. Instead of 130, we will have 1,000 years for our challenge. That's a, a, a much better situation. And for our purposes, although they are climate data, we can treat them as observations. So you don't have to worry about that. For you, they are observations. So you will get from me a training data set uh, covering 900 years to train your methods. So probably all your methods will be supervised training. And additionally, you will get a test data set of the predictors covering 100 years, so a new 100 uh, year data set. And with those predictors, you will generate a prediction of the North Atlantic Oscillation Index. I will test then th your predictions with the true value that I have for me, of course, you will not get this true value so that I can assess the skill of your methods. Um, this is just a very f a short introduction of our, uh, what is a climate model, for those of you that are not familiar. So a climate model <coughs> is, uh, well, divides the Earth on a mesh uh, with a grid size uh, and tries to solve all the dynamical equations of the atmospheric flow and also of the ocean flow and it has also some additional modules to, that simulate surface processes. For you, uh, this is really not very important. Just you need to know only that the data that I will provide you are sea level pressure and <coughs> temperature distributed over this grid uh, in the North Atlantic. So the variables represent the mean value of sea level pressure or temperature over one of those grids. More specifically, the predictant that we are going to predict is the North Atlantic Oscillation Index, average over the winter months, uh, and the, uh, well, the shape of this matrix is, of course, the number of years multiplied by one. So it's just a, a vector. The predictors, uh, for some of you probably called features, <coughs> will be the sea surface temperature and sea level pressure over the North and Tropical Atlantic. And they will be data average over the previous autumn. So October, uh, sorry, September, October, November, there's an error here. Um, and you will get a vector per year. So that the, the shape of this data set will be um, the number of training years, 900, and that is the dimension of the vector. The same for the second variable, sea level pressure. Uh, and all the data, just to facilitate a little bit your, your task, are normalized to mean zero already and to temporal standard deviation of one for each grid cell. And I will provide the data as a NumPy files, but also additionally, it's not written here, as NIT CDF files as well, for those of you that are more familiar with climate data. So the specific objectives, objectives of the challenge will be to predict the North Atlantic Oscillation Index in winter based on autumn predictors. Um, it may be that that's a very difficult problem, so I'm sure that's a very difficult problem. You can simplify that trying to predict only in a categorical way, so to predict the years in which the index will be just positive or negative. So that sounds easy to do but it will be still very difficult, uh, nevertheless very useful as well. If you come up with a, a method to, for a continuous predictions, that would be ideal, that would be wonderful, and that would be really a paper in a very high profile journal. But, of course, it's just a prediction of the extreme years, so, so the years in which the North Atlantic Oscillation would be above or below the extreme percentiles of the probability distribution, will be also very useful. That would be a categorical prediction in three categories, uh, and also will be very, very nice to, to get. My methodological suggestions. Of course, what, um, each of you is free to use any fancy methods. Uh, my suggestions um, uh, could be three of them. So the predictor fields are high dimensional. Um, 
so it, perhaps it will be convenient to reduce the dimensionality of the predictors, as I showed before, perhaps with a principal component analysis or autoencoder type of dimensional predictions. If you go to a categorical predictions, uh, you could think about support vector machine or similar methods. If you are familiar with image classification algorithms, you can also try those. Uh, actually, we are a little bit off the main road of the, the mainstream methods, but you can think of trying to classify an, an image of sea level pressure or sea surface temperature uh, as leading to a North Atlantic oscillation extreme. So the extreme will be not in the image itself, it will be somehow hidden. If you try yourself to uh, trust yourself to produce a continuous prediction, you could go then, of course, to a neural network. Uh, I would go for fully connected instead of a convolutional, but that's all open. You will have to try um, all approaches. Gaussian process, process regression could be perhaps useful and competitive uh, compared to neural networks, uh, depending on your setup. And of course, a K nearest neighbor approach, which is the easiest of all of them to implement. And in my experience, that could be quite competitive as well. So these are my, my suggestions, and well, I'm looking forward to your approaches. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo, for your insights. This sounds like a tricky but highly exciting challenge you provided there. As mentioned before, Eduardo is already in our Slack channel. So reach out to him if you got any questions. His handle is actually Eduardo Zurita. So go ahead uh, and ask him everything you want to know. Our next speaker is Willy Rath. He's working at the Geomar Helmholtz Centrum für Ozeanforschung in Kiel, and he's a researcher there. He researches ocean circulation and climate dynamics. I hope, Willy, you are already connected and with me. And if so, you can start with your presentation. Okay, if I've yeah. shared my slides, I think you can see them now. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, they look a bit cramped because I shifted everything from the bottom up because the live stream seems to seems to chop chop parts of that off. Uh, but otherwise, the, there will be a PDF of that or, or a, a presentation shared later by by Danielle. Um, so our challenge is about making sense of 15 billion or more than 15 billion uh, individual measurements uh, in the ocean. Um, it's actually eight times uh, 15 billion because at each point in the ocean we have different different variables. And your challenge will be to make, to make the most sense of these. Of course, we'll, 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 um, we'll help you and we'll, uh, we'll assist you and, and give you ideas on how to, how to go about that. But um, first, let me introduce so we are actually three people who will be available throughout the datathon. We are all from Geoma and Kiel and from the same group, the Ocean Dynamics Group, which is um, dealing with uh, theoretical oceanography, so uh, building and understanding and, and teaching the theory of, of ocean currents, of how, ocean how the ocean changes, um, of running and, and understanding ocean and climate simulations. So we are actually working on, on, the, on the big climate projections, or at least contributing to them, that you read about in the news. And in doing so, we are basically forced to build expertise with marine big data because we regularly handle um, hundreds of terabytes and more of data. Uh, we are Willi Rath, that's myself. I'm a data scientist and researcher with a physics background at, in this group. Katharina Höflich, who is a research software engineer uh, with a with a also theoretical or simulation oceanography uh, background, uh, who's today working on on interactive um, analysis on supercomputers and on on making these possible for for other scientists. And Tobias Schulzki, who is a PhD student, um, running and building ocean simulations and uh, running and understanding. Um, the kinds of experiments that we'll uh, detail in a second. Um, here at the bottom, you see a, a, a URL where we try to put together a few info points on the uh, on the data and on the challenges. So I won't go too much into detail about what the uh, what the data structures are, etc. Um, but maybe 
let me introduce you what you can learn from us or what you can learn during the challenge. Um, we are very, I think, very well versed with data science on, on supercomputers. Supercomputers are normally made for long running, unattended um, big simulations, but we are doing redevelopment in, in the direction of really making these available interactively. So you shouldn't get bored before the plot returns and you shouldn't get bored and distracted uh, before you get the question to your to your uh, the answer to your question so we try and make these available on minute time scales acting on huge data sets uh, you can learn about parallel and distributed computing with dask and other things and you can of course catch up insights on ocean and climate simulations um, the science behind the data that we provide is um, understanding the physical connectivity and the bio biological impact in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, that comes from a project that tries to find out um, how different marine protected areas in the Mediterranean Sea, where it's, for example, forbidden to go fishing, where you can't dump chemical waste, where you uh, need to keep the ocean floor intact, etc., how these can help keeping the whole METSI alive. Um, um, these experiments we ran are simulated pathways or simulated histories of fish larvae that spawn or come to life in a marine protected area spread out over some time. And then they follow um, simulated very high resolution ocean currents for about a month where we take uh, virtual measurements every hour. So we have a thousand waypoints along their path uh, where we know where they are, how um, how deep they are, uh, what the temperature there is, how far they traveled so far, etc. And then at some point they settle if they find a region uh, after a month uh, where they become real fish made and, uh, and let other larvae spawn later in the year or, or next year. The scientific questions we are after are, well, where do these larvae settle? Are they basically staying where they are or are they getting somewhere else? How do they get there? Um, could these limited protected areas really help keeping the, 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 the biolog biological diversity in the Mediterranean Sea alive uh, or uh, are they not sufficient for that? And then do different, different physics have an impact? So we ran these, these experiments with different um, physical parameterizations of the motion at the surface. One included uh, the effect of wave, the other doesn't. And we want to learn um, if and how these um, these impact the, the spreading of, of, for example, fish larvae in this region. Uh, the challenges we have provide, we provide or we, we propose are um, maybe three sub-challenges sub or you can also do that in, in, in separate. Uh, the, the overarching goal for us is to learn how to, or to, to optimize how to interactively visualize these data. If you store all this in an umpire array or in a, in a, in a floating point array at, at single precision, you'd end up with 500 gigabytes of data. And we want to want to build something that really gives you a new view of the data within minutes or better within seconds. Uh, we have a few ideas of, of how to do that. And uh, we, we want to see how far we can get if we, for example, use GPUs for the rendering or if we can, can put together many nodes on the supercomputer uh, for querying the data. In doing that, or in separate, um, you'll need to optimize um, how you store the data, how you structure the data, because here on the left-hand side, we have a real sample of the data. It's a, it's a tiny fraction of the points of the locations um, these larvae end up in. And you can imagine, so you can zoom in the, into this, um, and it keeps, keeps showing you new interesting structures. Uh, until the, the, the few hundred meter or kilometer, kilometer scale. And you can imagine that if you want to zoom into this, then you need to look up the data from these 500 gigab gigabytes of data uh, based on a region. And then you may uh, be interested in, well, maybe I'm, I hope you can see my pointer. Uh, maybe I'm interested in, in of these pathways and I want to select all the trajectories that pass through a point then I need to be able to immediately look up all the data that belong to these trajectories. And you probably want to avoid sweeping through the 500 gigabytes of data again and again. So this is something where people who, who are really versed with uh, data, database design, with um, access patterns, et cetera, really can, can, uh, can show what they, what, what they are able to do. And then uh, we also have a machine learning challenge where we want to 
find out if we can these can can automatically find these emerging pathways that you immediately see with the eye, right? If you look at, I'm, I'm not sure if you can see the, the pointer, but if you look at the pathway that goes from the E, the last E and challenge down here to the to the hashtag above, um, then you can easily, could easily draw that by hand and you could pair the width of that or the strength of that to a different pathway. It goes in, on a, in a different way. But how can you how can you identify and quantify these emerging pathways uh, using machine machine learning? Get in touch with us. As I said, we prepared a few materials that you find on this URL, and we created a challenge uh, support channel where we'd like to bundle all the questions that you can ask us while forming the teams, and that you can also ask us while working on the challenge. On the challenge, and I'd like actually to to encourage everybody to really communicate in the open. I think the, the, the competition is more about who's, who's best at, at finding these ideas, at, at solving technical, uh, at, 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 and, and, and at implementing these ideas. And we'd like to, to keep all the technical support in a challenge that can easily be looked up by others. All right, this is from me, and um, I'm free to being asked any questions you have um, in, the in the Slack channel, the Slack channel starting now. All right, thank you very much, Willy. Um, he spoiled a little bit of my information, but that's okay. So as you mentioned, you will find the pitches as PDF provided in the Slack channel later on. Um, again, the Q&A is going to happen in Slack as well. Um, so it's Willy, Katharina Höflich and Tobias Schatzky, which will be at your service. But I'll give you more information about all our coaches uh, later on. Also, um, about GitHub, we'll talk about that in a bit as well. And while you feel free to join the mentioned Slack channel of Willy, um, we will provide you with uh, channels for pitches later on. Um, but yeah, go ahead and of course do everything in public because it would be a waste if we don't know a question answered before. All right, we are running a little bit ahead of our schedule, but we'll see if that works out. So finally, we have Xiaozhang Zhu. She is head of department at the Earth Observation Center at the DLR, the German Aerospace Agency. She's passionate, passionate about space and math. Her research interests are Earth observation, signing processing, machine learning, and data science. And all that with a special focus on global urban mapping. So I hope you are with me. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Then thank you very much and the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot, Fabian, for introducing me. So, hey, everybody, here's Xiaoxiang from German Aerospace Center. Uh, before I start introducing the challenge, I say a few words about our center. And the DIA um, is one of the probably biggest uh, research center at Helmholtz with more than 8,000 uh, employees. And we have actually 26 sites uh, in Germany with uh, 50 institutions and the facilities. And basically, we are working on um, solutions on aviation, space, energy, traffic, security, and the digitalization. And now I will share my screen. So um, today's challenge is about uh, Earth observation data science meets climate. So for those of you who is um, not familiar with Earth observation, we are actually working with uh, satellites. So you see on the screen, a satellite is orbiting the Earth and the Earth is also rotating in the meantime. And in this way, we we'll actually be able to take measurements of the Earth's surface on a global scale. So you may wonder where we did this kind of information. We have been actually provide key information for different research areas like global trend research, earth system and environment science. Uh, meteorology is a, a classical field where we contribute. And we also uh, provide uh, indices for the UN's uh, sustainable development goals. And if we would have very high resolution, we can also uh, um, support uh, very practical things related to safety, security, mobility, down to urban planning. So um, why actually EO uh, has uh, something to do with uh, data science and why we're organizing uh, data sum today is because we actually entered a completely new era of observation 
here is just example of ESA's uh, mapper of the Earth observation satellite missions. Basically, there are 40 uh, satellites under development and 15 in operation. It has uh, three lines like metrology, this is a uh, service line, and there's a science explorer, more for explorative missions. And the really game changer and the mapper is in the middle of the Copernicus program with its uh, Sentinel satellite fleet. So basically, they are providing open and free data uh, to everybody, including uh, every one of you. And uh, they are basically providing uh, measurements of the uh, Earth's surface uh, globally on a weekly basis. Basically, this means Earth's observation has becoming a big data problem. And uh, of course, in order to somehow extract uh, the geo information we want from this type of data, and we need uh, uh, EO data analytics and the data science. And therefore, um, it's important, for example, to have uh, explorative uh, signal processing methods which benefit from the physical models of the measuring process. And it's important to be able to fill out uh, optimum data science approaches to fuse data from different sensors, ranging from optical sensors to radar. And uh, it's important to develop uh, mining uh, algorithms that can uh, actually efficiently figure out what are the inf uh, interesting information from the petabytes of data. And of course, um, if the data goes to this regime, we have to go more and more uh, data-driven type of an, an, an analytics. This means machine learning, data mining, uh, deep learning plays a big role. And also, uh, since we are talking about big data, then it's also important uh, to have the uh, competence also in big data management and uh, HPC. And today, the challenge is about uh, urban climate. So um, if you have been in Europe in the past years, so you can probably still remember the extreme hot summers we had and also the Christmas uh, where we are sitting uh, outside in the beer garden and um, you certainly um, agree with me. So it's very important uh, to understand the urban climate. To give another uh, motivation, uh, actually in 2014, uh, in the IPCC report, for the first time ever, there is a chapter on urban areas, basically to uh, confirm the importance of urban area on climate change. And um, in this particular challenge, what we are trying to do is to uh, um, map the so-called local climate zones on a global scale. So the local climate zones are defined uh, like you see on the screen, according to the height of the building, compactness of the building, and the percentage of green in the uh, area, and of course also the temperature. And this is uh, proposed uh, uh, from the urban climatology community, and uh, mapping such a uh, um, uh, local climate zones on a global scale can actually support a lot of uh, climate science activities. One example would be to uh, identify possible heat islands. And also, actually, this is also uh, a very, uh, let's say, useful schema for understanding urbanization um, because it also describes uh, the morphology of urban structure. So on the right, you basically see the urban climate zones classification of the Vancouver uh, area. And if you look at the uh, dark red area, this is uh, class number one, which is refers to the high rise compact area. This is actually the downtown area. And if you look at the number seven, then this is lightweight low rise. And if we map such a, a class globally, this helps us to figure out where are the possible slums. So this is just some motivation why we are doing this. And uh, exactly what you do today, you will be provided with uh, data sets. We call SOTOSAT LCZ42 data sets. And this is um, basically, we have uh, selected uh, 42 cities across the globe. And uh, we are working with the Sentinel-1 and the Sentinel-2 satellite data. And for all these uh, um, data, uh, cities, uh, we have altogether labeled uh, more than 400,000 uh, 
uh, pairs of Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data with one of these 17 classes I introduced to you earlier. And what is very unique uh, with this data set is that we also provide a labeling confidence. This means after the manual labels, uh, we let 10 uh, experts to independent vote such that you will know how reliable such a um, uh, labeling um, labels uh, actually are. And um, here is the key feature of the data sets. As I mentioned, uh, more than 400 pairs of uh, data patches with labeling confidence and covering all 10 culture zones across the globe. And um, it's a suitable benchmark uh, if you are interested in, for example, deep learning methods with image classification or data fusion, because we actually have two different uh, satellite data source or quantification of uncertainty, because we have a label confidence, which can give you a, a quasi ground truth and uh, many others. And the your, mission, uh, your mission will be basically take the data we have as uh, input and develop or improve uh, the model. We actually have a data uh, repository where we also put uh, already pre-trained model. And in the end, you should be able to get your own uh, LCZ classification maps. And this is the people you will be working with. So Andreas uh, is a, a team leader in my department who is uh, more from the background of uh, computer science and he can help you uh, with uh, design of the models. And uh, Jingyang is a postdoc uh, in my lab. So he is uh, one of the uh, um, uh, core members who developed uh, together with the team this, so to say, SEZ42 data set. And he is also the one who prepared uh, the baseline models. So he knows the problem very well, can help you both from the um, Earth observation and uh, um, basically machine learning sites. And Jakub is a, a PhD student of mine. So he has been actually working on these data sets for his PhD. I guess he can definitely also share quite some insights with you when it comes to the LCD classification. And uh, to get started, you basically need to download the data and then uh, you can basically check the benchmark repository we prepared for you. And then you can tailor your own model, train and test it. And uh, basically keep in mind, since this is a data set uh, representative so for the uh, global geographic regions, and the model you trained can potentially be applied actually for global local climate zones classification. Well, that's all from my side. Have fun. Thank you very much for the introduction. And with that, you've heard about all five challenges. Thank you very much for all the challenge providers for the information. As mentioned like five times, there's a Slack channel. I've heard that there just went out another email um, because there was an error with the sign up link. So if you didn't, we're not able to sign up yet. Just check your emails. You should be set now. Yeah, as that said, thanks to all the challenge providers, not only for being here today, but also for your work you did before, because there's a lot of work um, you have put into this information. And it's fascinating on which data sets you participants are able to work on. We are going to talk about another bunch of um, great supporters for our cause. Now it's time to thank our HPC partners. Um, in a minute, we will introduce, or you will get an introduction about the HPC systems you will be working with the next two days. And this would not be possible with our two partners, the Steinbruch Supercomputing Center at the KIT, the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and the Jülich Supercomputing Center at the Forschungszentrum Jülich. So thank you very much for your support and for providing all what the participants can use for the next two days. It's now my pleasure to introduce you to Sebastian Lürs and Samuel Braun. Both are experts in the HPC systems they will talk about in a minute. Of course, they're also part of our Slack channel. And just ping them if you got any questions. Their handles are Sebastian Lürs and Samuel Braun. Yeah, without further ado, I hope they are already connected. And then I'll hand over to Sebastian for the introduction. 
Yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you very much you. Uh, for this overview. I hope I, uh, you can hear me. Yeah, perfect. And um, I would like to give you some short introduction about the technical details on uh, the systems in Jülich. And afterwards, also Samuel will give some introduction on the systems uh, at the Steinbuch Center. To start, um, I would like to give a short overview about the Juli Supercomputing Center in general. So as already mentioned, we are part of the Forschungszentrum Juli, so one of the large Helmholtz centers. And uh, within the Juli Supercomputing Center, we are focusing on two aspects. The first aspect is mainly the support our users. So we have a large number of users who utilize our HPC systems. And we have users from the center out of our region. So we have a close collaboration to the um, RBTH Aachen University. Um, we also serve computing time as part of the Gauss Center for Supercomputing for researchers in whole Germany. So we offer calls for computing time. And also within Europe as part of PRAISE, we offer um, computing time to researchers all amongst Europe. We also have a large number of industrial users on our systems. So uh, even here, of course, HPC capabilities are quite relevant nowadays. From, I mentioned this already. So one uh, big aspect for us is support. So we try to provide support from the HPC point of view, so technical support, but also um, scientific specific support. So we have a large number of different simulation laboratories which directly talk on the same level like the scientists coming from the different areas. So it makes things easier to discuss certain aspects and to help on the simulation codes and um, within the uh, different questions which might arise when running on our systems. Of course, we also have a lot on R&D work. So we developing supercomputing facilities. So we normally run systems which are not directly the, would say, latest uh, or the typical system you can directly buy. So we try to develop new types of systems together with different vendors like IBM, Intel, and NVIDIA. So we try to also develop new types of systems and new types of HPC strategies and also on the different types of simulation codes for developing those codes in the different areas and also to work with the scientists to um, adapt those codes to the systems. And of course, education and training is also a large topic on our side. I just briefly mentioned it. So we have a large number of different simulation laboratories. So we support all the types of simulations running on our systems from material science to neuroscience to plasma physics to earth system science. So here um, we have a large number of people to help you and uh, to find what's your problem with the HPC systems. We run quite a number of machines through the years. So in the current generation, we have uh, four systems up and running or four large systems up and running. We have the so-called Eureka cluster and Jules cluster, which are quite typical cluster modules. So you have, uh, would say, uh, quite normal processors on the system. We have a so-called Eureka booster system closely connected to the cluster in a so-called modular approach. So you are able to use both systems at a time. And this system is based on KNL processors. And currently, which was originally planned also for this Datatron, but uh, of course it's a very new approach. So it will become available during the next few days or weeks, uh, will be the Jules booster system, which will be our new flagship system, which mainly based on the latest generation of um, NVIDIA GPUs. However, we of course wanted to have one system dedicated for this Datatron. So from our side, we selected the Yusuf system, which is a system from our side where we provide support for the so-called Phoenix research infrastructure. I just put it here a short link. So it's a uh, research infrastructure um, amongst Europe, which provide compute, computational capabilities for different aspects. And 
the use of system is one part of this um, of this infrastructure. And um, it's also a cluster-based system. So we provide in total uh, 200 nodes. And each node is equipped with 250 gigabytes of RAM and in total 128 cores. And 61 of those uh, nodes are, is, are also equipped with uh, one NVIDIA V100 GPU. In addition, of course, they are all uh, highly interconnected. And we have also a number of login nodes for the internet access. The main points which I just want to show in these slides are, first of all, regarding the system access. So how receive access to our system? Um, we decided it makes uh, the most sense to use Jupyter for the main approaches because it's quite easy to access. Of course, we also provide SSH access. So if this is an interested for one of the participants, just let me know. Um, but for the main focus will be the Jupyter-based access. And um, within the, uh, the guidelines you received during the last days, I think it's also linked within the, within the Slack channel, you will find a document uh, sitting on Google Drive where all steps are explained for the access. So here I just give the brief overview for, um, for those who didn't log in or um, prepared the access so far. So you will find a link in the document for apply for the access. So just follow the link. You have to fill in a short registration. Afterwards, you have to shortly wait. You will receive another mail that you were accepted for the project. So here I have to do this manual step to accept you for the project. And then next, you have to log in again to accept also this uh, system specific usage agreement. So it's just a click. And then after a few minutes, the account will be in place and you can log in to the Jupyter where you have to also accept another agreement. So just make another click and you are able to log in. Within the Jupyter system, so you will end up on the so-called Jupyter Hub, where you can deploy multiple Jupyter Labs. So Jupyter Lab is normally what you know if you, for example, worked already with Jupyter in the past. So in this Jupyter Hub, you can um, create as many Jupyter Labs as you want. And you can also run those in parallel if you want. Here, I just want to mention a few uh, details. It's also explained in the guideline. The um, main points are, uh, are there are three different partitions to select. So you can decide to select a login node, a batch node, or a GPU node. So a login node uh, is mainly meant if you want to, for example, download data, because only the login nodes are connected to the internet. The batch nodes and GPU nodes have no access to the internet. So here it will be necessary to download your data first on a login node, for example. And it's also helpful if you just want to make some small tests because the login nodes are normally directly available. So you do not have to wait for a free spot. Regarding the internet access, we only allow HTTP uh, um, access. So you can download from any HTTP source you want, um, just as a note. So if you have an SSH based access to GitHub, you need uh, to use your password instead. So SSH based access to the outside world is not available. For the uh, batch and GPU nodes, so the only difference is the batch nodes provide no GPU and the GPU partition provide one GPU. So depending on your uh, use case, you can either select the batch or the GPU partition for the, would say, larger ones. You can also select a reservation. So we have a reservation on the system in place because we run this Datatron in normal production. So there might be also other users using the system. We have 30 batch nodes dedicated and uh, 15 GPU nodes dedicated for the Datatron. So if you want to use those, you can just select this uh, HIDA Datatron reservation. Of course, it might happen that this will be full at, a point, at some point in time, so your job will not start. However, I think it should also, so currently it looks still fine, um, that you can also run uh, additional jobs without specifying the reservation in such a case. So then you will still be able to get your job started. For the number of nodes, it might be the best to just select 
one. In most cases, it's, uh, they f focus on uh, a single node approach, so you can utilize all the uh, 128 cores on this node and also the full RAM. So this is dedicated always to just one user. Um, there might be some approaches. Um, I saw some people are, might use tasks, so you can also use multiple nodes at a time. But of course, by default, with just using multiple nodes, you will not have a, a, a faster run. So here you need some uh, MPI setups or, for example, some task based approach to utilize multiple nodes at a time. So that's why mainly, I guess, uh, one node will be work for most of you. For the runtime, so this is the last important point, um, you have to specify the runtime if you run on the batch or GPU nodes. So this is the maximum runtime the job will uh, or the job will run and the Jupyter on the node will be accessible. It will automatically end if the runtime is reached. So please keep this in mind and specify a runtime which is long alas for your uh, work. Of course, you can restart it later on if you were kicked out, but um, if you use the runtime, which is long enough, then it should be fine. Just a remark, if you do not use the Jupyter Lab, maybe during night or uh, at any time, if you are going to lunch and do not want to do something, you can, within the Jupyter Hub, you can stop uh, this, uh, this running Jupyter Lab, and this, of course, allows others to use the nodes as well. For the rest, please follow the guidelines and please also uh, yeah, contact me in the Slack if you have any questions or problems. So I tried to gather some uh, help already within the documents. So for example, how to install personal additional packages. We are, of course have some packages pre-installed. We tried to look what might be necessary, but of course we never uh, can install everything from scratch if we don't know what is needed. So you can either install packages by yourself following the guidelines or also contact me and I can try to help you. And therefore, I want to hand over to Samuel to give some details also uh, on the systems at the Steinbuch Center. So, okay, can you hear me? Perfect. Perfect. So I quickly share my screen. Okay, so he hello everybody. Welcome to my part of the resources introduction. So my name is Samuel Braun and I'm working at the HPC unit of the KIT Compute Center. Um, in the next couple of minutes, I will briefly introduce the HPC resources provided to you by KIT. So, who are we? So we are the Steinbuch Center for Computing, SCC, and we are the Information Technology Center of KIT, and we provide resources for data-intensive computing and the analysis of large-scale data. And what are we doing all the day? So we search, teach, and create innovations in the fields of supercomputing, big data, and secure IT federations. And um, Basically, we operate large-scale research facilities um, and the basic IT services for KIT. What are the needs uh, which we address? So we cover the need of computational science and engineering and uh, also data-intensive science, not only for users at KIT, but uh, also um, within the entire federal state, state of Baden-Württemberg and also on national and international levels. So let me introduce our current SCC supercomputers. Currently there are two of them. And um, these supercomputers are part of Baden-Württemberg's supercomputing strategy, which is called BVHPC. There are several levels of HPC hosted at KIT, tier three and tier two. So tier three is the entry, so-called entry level where all employees of Baden-Württemberg's universities have access. Tier two is an intermediate level between the entry level tier three and the national and European high performance computing centers. And currently we have um, this tier two and three system. And um, so the, our next system uh, is called HORECA. Um, 
which has a noticeable amount of, of GPUs available. Up to now, all our um, computing resources basically rely on, on CPU performance or CPU um, peak performance. With the upcoming system, we'll uh, yes, have more GPUs available. So Horika will feature more than 60,000 CPU cores and more than 700, 740 NVIDIA A100, so uh, the, the peak performance will then be distributed 3 to 1 uh, between GPU and, and CPU. So this will be a tier 2 system, but for the datathon um, today and tomorrow, uh, we decide to choose uh, to, to J, um, take Baby Uni Cluster 2.0. So starting or the, or um, yeah, entry level does not uh, mean it's a it's a small system. So the system consists of more than 30,000 CPU cores and something like 140 uh, GPUs Tesla V100. And we reserved 40 of those um, Tesla V100 um, for this datathon. And if the GPU nodes are not sufficient, we also have um, 10 or 15 um, nodes reserved without GPUs. So keep in mind you are sharing uh, the compute resources. We are um, not on in normal operating conditions. So if you plan to use GPUs, please use the reservation. And um, if not, use this special queue. So how to access the resources? So it's a little bit more complicated than in Jülich. So um, basically, there are three steps to get access to the resources. First of all, you need an account. This account um, will be sent to you via email. If you have your account, um, you need to register a second factor device. I would suggest to use, for instance, Google Authenticator app or something similar. When you have your second authenticator, second factor authenticator app, um, registered then you can get a VPN connection so um, at the link here um, you it is explained how that works so when you have your second factor and your VPN co connection um, you can now log in access to the computing resources is either via Jupyter uh, or via SSH so if you choose the Jupyter approach, um, then you have to provide a password and the one-time password. Um, if you access the machines via SSH, um, it's inverse. P please provide first the one-time password and then your KRT password. And um, concerning Jupyter, I think um, Sebastian already uh, introduced Jupyter quite well. So I, I skipped that Jupyter introduction. And so let's directly go to the choice of resources. So basically, you need GPU nodes or non-GPU nodes. If you um, need the GPU nodes, we have a reservation for the GPU4 nodes. So GPU4 means um, this is a node where four Tesla V100 um, GPUs are available. And these nodes can be shared. So if you only need one GPU for, for instance, prototyping, please only choose one GPU. And the corresponding reservation to quickly get these resources is called HIDA Datathon GPU-4. Um, maybe there will later on today, there will be a second partition available, which is GPU-8. So if your software is capable enough to really use eight GPUs together, um, then you have the chance to use a node with exclusively eight GPUs for your workloads. If you don't need um, the GPUs, so you just use the partition Jupyter underscore UC1E. So there is no reservation, but I think there won't be a reservation required. So these are 10 to 15 nodes, which are kind of hidden. So if you choose um, this uh, partition in the drop-down menu of, of Jupyter Hub, I think you will quickly get access to, to the nodes. 
And that's it from my side. So um, too long, didn't listen. So if you didn't listen to me, so please now listen. So do you have to follow just three steps to get access to our machines um, concerning account creation and uh, Jupyter and software. And um, if you have a question, please feel free to ask them in Slack or I also have a FAQ um, site um, on the same URL. So that's from my side. Thank you for listening. And um, I hand over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank Sebastian you. and Samuel, for the introduction, as well as your support in the Slack channel and, of course, the computing power. Whew, that was already it. Um, so you got all the information for now, but there's still a little bit more to talk about. I got a few notes for you. So. First of all, we are in this together. So make yourself helpful, please. This means if someone from another um, group is asking for your help, don't hesitate and help them. Um, give away your expertise and get expertise from others. So yeah, it's, it's a networking opportunity. So it shows this as well. Please contact each other. It's, it's really important. I got told that's like dozen time, um, make networks and, and connect each others. Yeah, use that chance. If you are starting with the ideation phase in a minute, um, create as many ideas as possible. So um, don't run with the first one. The first one is probably never the, the best. So write down as many ideas as you can create as a team, as a group, um, and then decide on later which one was the best. And that said, build on the ideas of others. So don't, don't belittle or ignore ideas of someone because they might sound stupid at the beginning. Um, we got lots of different people from lots of different expertises here. Um, so their expertise is maybe on a different space where, where you are from. So um, listen to the day ideas and build of them. Um, yeah, as I said, just, just improve ideas of others. Take breaks. Um, while we know time is limited for the data thon, um, it's, it's super important to take some breaks. Um, for example, after you've, you build your team, it's a good time to get something to eat if you're hungry. Um, yeah, so once in a while, get a coffee, get some, get some fresh air, stay away from the screen for a few minutes. This might get your creative juices flowing as well. And it's super important that you work together. Um, so be a team and not just a bunch of people in a group. Um, the magic happens if you work together on different areas and expertise and, and just communicate and yeah. So please connect, reach out, talk to each other, share your knowledge, exchange, however you want to call it. But last but not least, and most importantly, have fun. It's, it's a serious topic you guys are challenging here, but um, yeah, you sh you're here for the fun part. So make the most of it and um, enjoy the time because that's, um, you're in an in extremely unique uh, opportunity here. So please use it and enjoy. All right, so now it's time for the pitches and the team building phase. So please have a look at the screen if you are looking somewhere else. We have um, five challenges all for the before mentioned challenges. Um, you can find them in Slack as well. Just search for them if you are not in there or have a look at your sidebar. After joining either one or more or all of those challenges, um, you can either write your idea or join someone's idea um, and basically form a team with them. So if you don't know how to do that, um, so if you are having an idea, just um, write a short pitch. So it's, it's about a short introduction um, of what you want to be working on quick and yeah, yeah, precise. And if you don't have an idea and want to work with someone who actually posted an idea, please use a Slack thread so we get a little bit better of overview in the channels. So uh, the screen is showing you how to do it. So basically, as soon as someone is writing their pitch, you just hover over it, select the imp thread antworten of Deutsch. Um, so um, just create a thread and then you can answer in there. So this keeps it a little bit more um, centralized for us. Yeah, and as mentioned, if you found your team, um, which it should be as next, uh, your next step, um, join and create an open Slack channel. So um, give yourself a name. It can be actually whatever you want. Create a Slack channel and keep it open. You have the opportunity to do a private channel, an open channel. We want it to be open because um, the mentors might join you. 
also, as mentioned before, there is a GitHub. Um, you all should be part of that GitHub and um, at least remember to publish the projects there. So whatever you are going to work on the next few days, publish information there. There are also um, a few informations from all the projects as well as informations from the, the mentioned, um, as mentioned before, from the challenge providers. So check it out. Um, it's written in the Slack channel as well, I guess. And we got a lot of coaches uh, for your service. So I won't call out uh, each one of them, but uh, thank you very much of our coaches. Um, they are in the help channel. They will most likely introduce themselves there and you are free to ask them any kind of questions. So um, use their knowledge, uh, brain pick as, as people say. Um, yeah, so thank you very much the coaches for the support. Um, dear, dear participants, reach out to them and um, yeah, get them all, all your questions answered as soon as possible. Yeah, and with that, that's it for now. Um, as mentioned lots of times, if you need any help, reach out in the help channel. We are um, as a team there for your support, as well as all our mentees and coaches and challenge providers and everything, everyone else. We will see each other again tomorrow at 9 a.m. As mentioned before, don't worry, it will be recorded. So whenever you join us again, just watch the recording. Um, it's important that you watch it, so please do it. Um, but as I said, you can do it whenever you want. Um, now it's basically time to build your teams, pitch your ideas, and then get a break, get something to eat, 